Hi guys, it's Claire Nocti from Cosmetique Astrology, and today I'm going to be doing a video about K2, especially uh, your K2 nakshatra, and how you can use that nakshatra to access the ability to channel creative projects and to just access and increase your creativity in general. And I will give a lot of examples of certain artists whose creative projects really reflect their K2 placement. And I'm going to be explaining how the K2 placement really relates to one's daimon, and I'll talk about what that is in a minute. But this video is kind of somewhat a continuation of a video I did a few months ago called K2 astro projection in your k2 or something like that um which i will link here so in that video i talked about reciting the bija mantra the seed syllable of the god of your k2 so you recite that bija in order to achieve the trance state to reach your astral base to see your daimon and also to like leave your body from this astral base in order to astrally project so these kind of things that i've discovered have to do with research combining nakshatras with like occultism and occult studies so this video is just kind of a blending of, of that and, and it will be a pretty long video I think I feel like there's so much to say about this subject and I just want to put it all in one place so you might have to you know watch this video in two sessions or watch it while you're cleaning or watch it while you're doing cardio or something like that so what the daimon is um, I'll just refresh a little bit from that last video that I did the daimon which is also called the Korean could even be called the personal kundalini it is the protective, guiding, and creative force within you that also assists you in all magical and artistic endeavors. Um, it is your opposite, and it personifies itself in your astral experiences as the opposite gender. And what I have noticed a ton over and over is it will personify itself with the traits of people who have their primary placements as your K2 nakshatra. So for example, if you are a man with K2 in Ashleisha, you might often dream of certain women that you know or certain celebrities or women with traits of people who have Ashleisha, Lagna, or Moon in Ashleisha. And they will be kind of like embodiments, personifications of your actual daimon in your astral experiences. Often your first dreams of them or your strongest dreams of them will take place when the moon is in your K2 nakshatra. That's something if you've had important dreams, you can check uh, what the, which nakshatra the moon was in at that time. And if it's in your K2 nakshatra, there's a big chance that it was a dream about your daimon. And this is just something that has happened over and over with me, people in my life, clients, whenever um, we do like deep explorations of their dream symbols and their personal diamonds and their charts in the chart of uh, the time period when they were having a dream and that kind of thing. It's just shockingly accurate and it literally shocks me all the time how much the realm and figures in dreams represent your K2 placement. So you can watch that video that I mentioned to find out how to identify your daimon on the astral and begin using it. It's the chief thing that brings you knowledge. It's the key to all of your experiences and the material and spiritual world. Like I talked about recently in the K2 Dominant Men video about K2 people being able to really uh, absorb understanding and knowledge from life experiences so they gain a ton of actual gnosis and experiential knowledge rather than like intellectual or book knowledge. So your daimon, which totally relates to K2, it's the root of your being that can absorb and synthesize all of your experiences and knowledge. It allows you to distill knowledge from anything that you touch if you're in contact with your daimon and then integrate that into your being. So all of the positive traits of K2 men that I talked about who have the most natural abilities with this kind of practice as well as K2 women, um, anyone can access those abilities if they actually just get in touch with their K2 in their chart. It opens the doorway for you to have certain skills, like spiritual skills, like astral projection, like I said, talking to spirits, healing, divination, all that kind of thing. And each person's diamond has both good and negative qualities. And one of the key things to understanding how to use it without succumbing to its negative quality is to guard and protect your aura from obsession and possession, from forces that attempt to derail you from the truth and make your daimon start whispering false information to you. And that is really the purpose of daily spiritual practice if you're doing the right kinds, where it guards your daimon or your kundalini from going crazy. So before we get into the creativity aspect, there is a dream interpretation service on my site where I interpret your dreams along with your chart 
and if you have the date and time of the dream along with that as well. Literally every dream is so meaningful if you analyze it in relation to what message it's carrying based on your chart, your dashes, your placements. It's really shocking and it's one of my least expensive services and actually probably one of my very favorite services to do. So I would love if you would check that out, especially if you ever have a really profound dream that feels really important to you. I can guarantee you it is carrying a very important message for you. So yeah, in this video I'll be extending the understanding of the Daimon and K2 to show with tons of examples how your K2 nakshatra and Daimon relates to your creative ability and your ability to connect with your personal genius, like uh, to channel creativity. And the god of a person's K2 nakshatra really contains their personal key to creativity and will have an imprint on every single thing that they make in an imaginative sense. Like I said, which I'll show you examples of with artists in a minute. Our daimon tempts us with the knowledge and power that it brings us, and the key to occult mastery is to learn how to dominate and control this being, which I talked about in the K2 Dominant Men video. So first we have to figure out how do we open ourselves up to both commanding our daimon but also receiving information from it. And the secret for all people is writing. That's the real reason why keeping a journal is so important because it gradually reveals to us the communication and instructions that this being can bring to us from our angel or our spiritual master within, which is our center of command, the Ajna Chakra. So the daimon isn't evil, but it can bring you faulty information um, if you don't maintain a tight control over sexual energy. And when a person is successfully controlling their daimon, then creative genius seems to come from some strange force that flows through them endlessly, which enriches everyone around them. So depending on especially like which house your K2 is in and that kind of thing, this creative genius can express itself in singing, uh, modeling, writing, drawing, dancing, oratory abilities, anything like that. It will always express the nature of the K2 placement. So although the genius may begin giving us secrets of martial arts or the ability to write poetry or the secrets of sexual magic or anything else like that, we will initially have to begin learning how to channel the knowledge of our daimon by journaling. I have, I guess, three books that I'll just briefly mention. And the first one that I'm going to mention, this book on writing, by the, the very, very famous author, Stephen King. He actually writes about the process of channeling in really great detail and, you know, just describes how pretty much none of his books are plotted out. He doesn't plan them ahead. What kind of happens is he waits until certain characters start to come through him and then they create the story, like what situations they get themselves into. So the main thing that people do who create really amazing works of creativity is rather than planning it out really carefully, it's learning how to, like like the K2 people I talked about recently, open up and just totally open up themselves to receiving messages, receiving influence from the universe, and then putting it out again in a new way. So when we incarnated, we really did so with a spiritual mission, which is contained in our K2. And by saying the bija of the deity related to our K2, we began connecting ourselves to the source of this purpose. And our writings really do begin to show the guidance and insight that it brings us. And after doing this daily, a person will notice a change in their writings and questions that they're asking might start to be kind of answered by receiving certain messages and things like that. And you have to continue this practice for many, many years while avoiding obsession and egotistical inflations in order to keep that stream of creativity pure and not polluted by ego and that kind of thing, which I also talked about in the K2 Men video. So if we are successful, we'll have works of genius which we give to the world and which represent the unique contribution that our soul gives to the world. So there are two things that affect creativity, K2 being the daimon and moon being the libido and the sense organs and everything that a person prefers. Based on your moon placement, which is just totally the most natural thing, you don't have to tap into it or anything, you'll really be doing it naturally. When you start using that placement, that nakshatra of your moon, um, so you start to use your senses and satisfy your libido with your moon placement, 
your rational mind goes away, and that's when your headless K2 surfaces, which is your daimon. And I'm going to discuss in a video in the future how your lunar placement ties into your creative works, which you guys have seen a lot, I think, in my next chakra in the modern media videos, how often certain movies and things like that reflect a nakshatra, especially of the moon placement of the people who are involved in or creating that movie. So that's all the kind of external glamour of the thing that you create. And then a little bit behind that, the true message that your creative works are carrying, that's where your K2 nakshatra comes in. And that's the part that's really channeled from the universe and isn't a part of your personal identity or your ego or anything like that. And so that's why the biggest and most prolific artists, they usually say that their work is channeled. Like I said, Stephen King says that, David Lynch, Bob Dylan. It comes from a part of them that they don't understand, and that is their K2s. So if you saw my MAGA Moon in the Modern Media video, or my K2 Men or K2 Women video, you know that people who are immersed in K2 energy obsess over the creative process and channeling either creative projects or spiritual understanding. So our K2 being our daimon, it's that thing that we know and that we do that's relevant to everyone because we did it without our ego. It's a special little area and niche in the universe that, that we are truly deeply experts on. We can tap into a huge amount of knowledge in that area. And when an artist is channeling their K2, everyone can find meaning in it because it's objectively good creativity. It's not debatable. It's relevant to everyone because you're doing it without your ego. So it's this strange thing that has the ability to impact the whole world. So like I talked about that the daimon often personifies itself, you could kind of relate that to the idea of an uh, creative muse and that an artist's creative work will usually revolve some way around the personification of their daimon and it's essentially the main thing that they know in a gnosis sense because it is essentially the accumulation of all of their past experiences so when it's strong a person tends to not have much trouble in life because it being a person's ketu is the force which protects them and that's why Dumvadi uh, is also a messenger bringing all kinds of information to us which is why ketu is associated with research and that is why k2 is also associated with our access to hidden knowledge that can't be understood intellectually like i talked about in the other video the sanctuary of gnosis and this sanctuary of gnosis is open to anyone who cultivates the inner wisdom necessary to enter and in order to obtain it one has to learn how to use their k2 or personal daimon to prove themselves basically worthy to enter what is called the Vault of the Adepts. So the Vault of the Adepts has seven sides, and seven is the number of K2 itself, alluding to this being the planet which allows us to achieve self-mastery as well as liberation or moksha. And this planet in our daimon itself allows us to be free from being dependent on any external person or book for knowledge. And instead, it allows us to gather and synthesize any kind of knowledge that our heart desires without needing to submit to any person or anything. And that's why I think K2 people are often more so the leaders of cults because a lot of people respect them for the fact that they notice that K2 people aren't submitting to anyone else. They're just gathering and accumulating knowledge themselves and then tons of people just want to listen and submit to them. So accessing your K2 gives you that kind of ability that you can gather knowledge on your own because you're tapping into this universal knowledge rather than needing to rely on someone else who could tap into that themselves. K2 is in a sense the most important planet because it allows you to extract the most out of all of your life experiences and even extract the essence from other people's experiences. K2 is like a butcher in that it picks clean all the meat or essence out of any experience, any object, any situation very quickly and assimilates the essence or knowledge into itself and it's for that reason that k2 allows a person to develop that direct perception of any aspect of reality the only issue with the daimon and k2 is that it can create such stability and stillness um, that if a person hasn't escaped its control over them it can hold them back from achieving anything new which is our rahu and we have to be thoroughly in touch with our rahu actually and our ajna center before we can be completely in touch with our smoky k2 or else we may and likely will get lost in the smoke of the past ourselves but back to the creative aspect sorry i, I told you guys this would be long and kind of a rambly video but tapping into your daimon um, when you create art and you have tapped into your daimon, 
you're tapping into something that when people perceive your art, they're perceiving something real because like I said, it's not infiltrated by your ego. People can sense that when you make something, it's not just a portrait of your ego. It's something that's a true message from the universe. It's something that's truly relevant. And so if you do tap into your K2, you are way more likely to become influential because your artwork will possess a contradictory dual nature, which makes it a complete message that can be understood by everyone and will seem quite remarkable because of this quality. So your diamond and your K2 is essentially the part of you that gets possessed by something that has a different kind of intelligence than you're aware of consciously in this life. So it communicates messages through you that even you will overlook until you watch, you know, what you made again or read what you made again because you're tapping into a certain facet of reality and you are expressing that perfectly. K2 being headless, your rational mind isn't a part of it. So your rational mind is going to miss a lot of it, not understand a lot of it. And only um, when you have time to kind of look at it again, you might start to understand it better and better. For example, when you're doing anything creative as a child, like playing dolls, or if you have an imaginary friend, your diamond will usually come out as the first major creative imaginary friend or character that you play as a child. So oftentimes, especially if you were creative at all during puberty, the diamond reveals itself in its very true form at that time because it's a time whenever you have sexual energy built up but you aren't actively engaging in sex yet. Most of us aren't during puberty. And so you'll see a really pure manifestation of your diamond in your artwork. So if like you wrote books or something in the time when you were a teenager or you made music or anything like that, if you go back and look at the things that you made at that time, they're likely to be super in touch with your diamond, even though throughout your whole life you're going to be influenced by it. As you get older, your rational mind, your knowledge, your intellectual knowledge gets bigger and bigger and infiltrates your creative projects a little bit more. So if you're trying to contemplate the characteristics of your diamond, consider the archetype that you obsessed over as a teenager. It's the main archetype that you enjoyed fantasizing about in a creative sense. For example, in the last video I did, I mentioned a client that I have who has K2 and Ardra, and as a young girl of about 14, she wrote stories and fantasized about a tortured young boy who got physically abused by his father, struggled with drug use and suicidal thoughts, and took his pain out on others as violence, like a sensitive bad boy, and he was a guitar player. So all of those things came together to create kind of the archetype that she loved to fantasize about. And if you saw my Ardra in the modern media exploration, this is a perfect archetype of Ardra men, so her K2 placement. In that Ardra men are these sensitive men who act tough, such as um, Robert Pattison in Twilight, he's an Ardra moon native. Ardra Moon native Heath Ledger in um, 10 Things I Hate About You. These are the things I mentioned in that video, but Ardra Moon native Ryan Filippi in the movie Cruel Intentions, and I didn't mention it in the Ardra video, but it's even shown in Ardra Moon native um, Drake, the rapper who is loved by women for his like tough persona, but especially loved by women more than they like other rappers because his persona has a lot more complexity and depth to it than the average rapper with lyrics that are sprinkled with like nostalgic things and loving things and and a lot of sensitivity and this is also shown in Kurt Cobain in real life who's an Ardra Moon native and my client said that when she read Kurt Cobain's published journals a few years later, she literally felt like she was reading the stories that she'd written as a teen because they matched the archetype scarily perfectly. If you watch the TV show Stranger Things and if, you, if you've seen season two, that was another Ardra archetype that really stood out to me. There's that, um, the new character who, he has the redhead sister and he is like a bully. But then you would find out that he's kind of abused by his father and he's actually like sensitive and upset inside and then I checked and he is also an Ardra Moon native so you can see how this archetype matches so well with the way that she liked to express herself when she was a teenager before she was aware what this was and that was her being really in touch with her diamond and you can do the same thing likely if you look into your creative projects at that age. The next thing I want to show you is just a book that's written by a modern secular academic Harold Bloom and it's called The Diamond Knows, and it explores especially American writers and their relationship with their diamond. Lots lots of writers, you know, who, who have talked about this spark of creative genius that they channel, like Emily Dickinson, T.S. Eliot, Walt Whitman, Robert Frost. And um, talking about Robert Frost, 
this book uses an example of the poet Robert Frost and Robert Frost saying that there's double meanings in his poems and saying that his poems talk in contraries. Like I said, that channeled artwork actually always has multiple interpretations. There's a mundane interpretation and then there's an advanced interpretation depending on the level of the person who is um, experiencing the artist's work where it depends if you can understand or not how in touch with your daimon you are, how well you, you know, how in touch with universal understanding that you are, how well you can understand what that artist put out there um, from his connection to his daimon. So, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So yeah, this perfectly shows how what the daimon creates has a meaning that can only be discerned by those who have the necessary gnosis or intuition to grasp it. And that's why so many artists seem so enigmatic, because their work carries messages that transcend their apparent meaning. And that's a great definition between the esoteric and the exoteric, and the division created by the letter versus the spirit of the word, of the meaning of anything written, and when people create with their daimon, they create with the Sandhya Baza, or the Twilight language. It's a language that's understood by all initiates, but remains obscure to the average person. Because it requires the ability to tap into one's intuition and gnosis to obtain the true meaning. So although other people can appreciate and enjoy the artwork, they might not get the actual initiated understanding of the artwork. Okay, so now I'm going to give some artist examples. So hopefully you are familiar with, if not all of the, these artists, at least some of them. And if I mention an artist who has your K2 next chakra and you aren't familiar with them, I recommend checking out that artist. So the artist examples that I have here are Martin Scorsese. Most people are probably familiar with him. He's a director. He is K2 in Shada Bahisha, and he's obsessed with showing, if you think about his movies, manipulative individuals who access secret privileges through crime and maintaining a social order outside of the laws of society, underground social networks, um, social networks being the 11th house, and people who are accessing special privileges through a social network or a crime network. Martin Scorsese's recent movie, Silence, also shows Rahu, which is Shada Bahisha's roller, in depicting the issues that individuals practicing foreign religions create and focusing on the clash of different cultures and the strange um, suspension of laws and confusion of laws when that occurs. Next, I have Quentin Tarantino, who has K2 in Uttar Ashada. If you've seen what I've said about Uttar Ashada before, I think it was in the MMA fighter video where I talked about Uttar Ashada. Uh, being the next chapter that has to do with all of those films that have to do with witty banter between men, male camaraderie, talking about the mysteries of women, and those are all the things that Quentin Tarantino movies really circle around, men supporting each other and overcoming yin forces. And that's why I think the movies of Quentin Tarantino tend to be the favorites of young boys because Uttar Ashada is about the mysteries of men, just as its opposite, Ashleisha, is about the mysteries of women. Next, I have H.R. Geiger, who uh, I mentioned in the Ravadi video, and I'm going to mention again here. H.R. Geiger has K2 and Ravadi, and his work shows the sexual and alien-like nature of Ravadi Nakshatra, as well as the way that adepts who reach Ravadi stage seem extremely mechanical, inhuman, and alien compared to others due to the fact that they absorb all impressions and have channeled all of their light into the upper centers, seeming superhuman, because Revati is the height of Mercury's coolness, which is transcending human emotion and relatability. The, next, the artist H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft has another Mercury role to K2 placement, just like H.R. Geiger, but H.P. Lovecraft's is Jeshja, and if you're familiar with H.P. Lovecraft's work, he writes about the Elder Gods constantly, which he calls the Great Old Ones. And as you probably know, Jeshja is the eldest. Next we have Carl Jung, who channeled the Red Book um, with his daimon named Philemon. And it's full of like skillful drawings and 
calligraphy and all this kind of thing and which relates to his K2 and Hasta. And then there's Franz Kafka and his book The Metamorphosis, The Trial, and In the Penal Colony. Franz Kafka has his K2 in Barani, whose god is Yama, who's in charge of punishing souls. So Franz Kafka's work is really related to this Barani placement because he has this constant theme of an existential sense of persecution running through all of his work and it really points to his genius being so strongly related to Yama because Yama deals with the punishments after death and in the short story in the penal colony an unnamed narrator describes the use of an elaborate torture and execution device that carves the sentence of the condemned prisoner on the skin before letting him die over the course of 12 hours. So Barani and Revati, the elephant yonis, they tend to fetishize punishment, as I mentioned a lot in the Revati in the modern media exploration. And this is channeling the types of punishment which Yama gives to those who die and who have committed karmic wrongdoings. And this kind of explains the contradiction between the popular idea of Franz Kafka as a tortured artist and the reality of Franz Kafka, who was really not tortured at all and even quite humorous and jovial in nature. What he was writing wasn't really him, it was him channeling his daimon, that darker aspect of Barani, which was outside of him. And that reminds me of David Lynch too, who also said that just because you portray suffering in your artwork doesn't mean that you are suffering. David Lynch is a primary example of someone that I'll talk about too, who's channeling his K2. He has K2 in the dark and scary sign of Mula. And in fact, having your K2 in a scary sign often means you are quite happy in the sense in a sense, because you're really separate from and rather you're under control of that force. That force protects you and even rewards you if you're balanced and the harsh energy secures your place in the universe by creating a smoke that obscures people who would hurt you. And speaking about David Lynch, David Lynch has K2 in Mula and his uh, artwork always shows the smoky demonic influences which shape the underbelly of society as well as how those forces like in the show Twin Peaks, how those forces change the seemingly mundane and normal lives that most people think they live. So like Harold Bloom, the author of The Diamond Knows book, I really believe that the chief distinction to determine a great artist or an initiate um, is, to, is their ability to channel messages which show evidence of intelligence that transcends the limitations of a normal human as in they're in touch with their genie or their genius, they're abnormally intelligent in this certain area or, or about this certain thing, and they're contributing things to the world that transcend their ego and instead speak to the enlightened universal consciousness. And the mystery of one's daimon is related to also to the mysteries of possession, which are clearly shown in religions like Haitian voodoo, in which disembodied beings overtake the minds of people and then explain situations or give advice or give warnings and blessings through human vehicles. And the people who host these beings are unaware of what they're saying and are simply like individuals who open up and channel their daimon. You know, they're opening themselves up to that transcendental universal intelligence, which uses them as a medium to convey the messages. And regarding um, the nodes taking a little while to change from one nakshatra to another, many people around your age have the same Rahu or Ketu placement as you but only certain people tap into the genius and so they kind of speak to and for that group of people. And then of course keep in mind that the nodes function and manifest differently in the different houses as well and I will probably touch on that in a future series. Now Rahu, which is opposite to your K2, relates to your angel in the Ajna Center like I mentioned, which has to always be kept in perspective to control the, demo the demonic force of K2 and the stage of activation of the Ajna and getting in touch with your guardian angel is shown in the Mahavidya of Chinamasta. So the image of Chinamasta shows the type of sacrifice required in order to overcome the negative hold that the daimon has over a person and reap only the positive benefits of it as a messenger that we fully control and so it only channels truth and doesn't begin whispering false information to us like I mentioned earlier. And another thing is that you probably noticed that certain artists will be considered like hot for a certain time and that everything they're channeling is outrageously genius and at a certain point sometimes they even admit it that their insight and inspiration or genius leaves them 
and that's due to them for some reason one reason or another losing contact with their daimon in chronicles volume bob dylan writes about becoming an influential human and influencing the era in which he was born and to do this he said uh, and I quote, you've got to have power and dominion over the spirits. I have done it once. He says such individuals are able to see into the heart of things, the truth of things, not metaphorically, but actually see, like seeing into metal and making it melt, see it for what it is and with hard words and vicious insight. So he felt that he'd had contact with it for a time and then lost it. Any art that is channeled straight from the daimon is an embodiment of universal truth, and because truth endures, it will speak to people for centuries into the future, um, unlike artwork that is ego-based or is just uh, politically charged or something like that. So you can think of many artists' creations as scrying the realm of their K2 and then expressing it, and like I said, your K2 has a lot to do with accessing the astral world and your imagination. It's really what you like to imagine, the realm that you enter when you close your eyes. I just want to give like a final little warning about this in all of these practices is to remember the fine line between genius and basically schizophrenia. Both of these things, both of these types, they find meaning in everything, and it all depends on keeping your daimon under control so that the things that you hear and um, that you start to understand, so that they're true. True genius is recognizable by the quality of work that a person produces, and an amateur or a person whose daimon has begun controlling them will always begin by producing information that first of all nobody else agrees upon instead of producing literature that enriches a specific community within the parameters of the field. And the sign that a person's daimon has begun controlling them is also if they kind of start spouting nonsense and then defending this information and creating kind of like a me against them mentality or insulating themselves from all criticism and beginning to kind of try to force others to submit to these delusions that they've created. And this is the real reason why spirituality is so dangerous because awakening one's daimon and not controlling it can lead to actual insanity and soul loss as the person becomes an actual slave to their daimon, um, working only destruction upon themselves and the earth. You can see this with Aleister Crowley's star pupil, which was Frateric Cod, who initially produced works of genius regarding Hermetic Kabbalah, which was how his daimon began making itself known to him. And after taking certain oaths, he began showing signs of obsession and began thinking everyone was out to get him. And he started believing he was kind of like a messiah meant to save the world. And he wrote books which had a new system of gematria and Kabbalah that nobody else agreed on. And so it made his ego very happy and he couldn't face any criticism with adopting this new system. And the slow descent into madness is common in those who initially began showing real occult promise. And it's really a sad fact and this phenomenon can also be seen with figures like L. Ron Hubbard, Carlos Castaneda, and other cult leaders who began tapping into their genius only to be destroyed by it. So that's just a warning that embarking on these kind of things, like I said, you have to be really looking out for your daimon kind of feeding you ego-inflating delusions.